So we met, uh, I think we actually met with at the, uh, like a Bhagavad Gita um, reading club or book club that was online. And then we did uh, one on critical race theory more recently. And now we're doing some existential existentialism. So we're kind of all over the map. But uh, I like that you're eclectic like I am. You kind of read a bit of everything. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th- those were the, the three um, things that I think we've been through together. And really, we've only been through two of them together. We're going through the third one now. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I don't even know what you think of all this Camus stuff or, you, you know, we've kind of emailed back back and forth an outline to kind of figure out how we're going to go through this because this is a pretty dense piece. Uh, this is my second time reading it. And yeah, I just felt like, um, <laughs> yeah, I read it through twice this time and took like diligent notes and it was still, uh, still pretty difficult piece and, and kind of hard to understand him at times. And yeah. What did you think about just, just on un- like from an understanding kind of comprehension standpoint? Yes. Um, my number one top priority take on uh, Myth of Sisyphus is it's really obfuscated. Um, mm. I, I find that, so I've not read a lot of Camus either. I've read this and I've read The Plague. And uh, just today I read his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. Oh, cool. From 1957. Um, and The Plague was like real, pretty straightforward. It like, it was fiction. It just says what happened, and you know, so and so did so such and such, and so and so said so and so. And if any part of it didn't make sense, you could just kind of say, "Okay, that character does things that doesn't make sense," and you know. And mostly, it, it was pretty straightforward. Mm. And then, whenever he's writing this sort of non-fiction, like art writing, he goes into a completely different mode where he's got lots of double negatives and. Uh, um, sarcastic turns of phrase uh mm. and where he will say explicitly you know over and over in this um in this work he's saying you know and so we see that x is true or rather not x and it's like come on man <laughs> yeah i i found i found that difficult as well and yeah i i've not read a ton of Camus either i, I read the the outsider and another one of his essays but yeah, it, it's 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 a completely different tone um, than his fiction. You know, he's very like I don't I don't know, very like exacting. You can like this is kind of his like it's kind of like his left brain versus his right brain doing the kind of more fiction writing, um, or at least until he gets to the end, where the, the myth of Sisyphus is more kind of. Uh, he lets himself go a little bit more literary. Uh, exactly. He kind of gets away from the, the logic and the syllogism a little bit towards towards the end. It, it very much gives a sense of him working out the problem live, um, which is thematic because it's a essay about the process of working things out, right? It, mm. Sort of going through that and demonstrating for you going down blind alleys and so on but it is very frustrating at least for me to read this uh, uh, say like did you come up with an answer why don't you just tell me what the answer is yeah so that that is so it's an interesting point i I wanted to bring that up too and that this is very much written as like you are witnessing a man kind of trying to figure a problem out this is not him saying like you know, I came to this grand conclusion. Let me tell you about it. This is very much just like, I'm starting with a question. I have no idea where this is going to go. And for me, it was very interesting. The first time I read this, for whatever reason, I skipped the preface. And in the preface, he kind of gives away his conclusion in terms of like what he thinks our response to the absurd should be. So when I was reading it the first time, you know, he starts this, and we'll talk about it. He starts with, like, the only serious philosophical que- question is whether or not we should kill ourselves. And, like, it wasn't until, like, page 115 or something that I actually knew where he was going with this. I was like, I, 
I, I had no, I, I was just kind of like on the edge of my seat, just like, what is he going to conclude? Like, are the final pages just going to be like sp- spattered blood? Like, I mean, I, <laughs> I obviously knew he didn't actually kill himself, but, but it is very much somebody trying to write um, from a place of curiosity. In writing from a state of confusion, uh, which we'll also talk about, right? Of conf- being confronted with the irrational and, and the, the fact that we can't, reason does not work. He already knows that. Again, that's what the thing is about. Um, but he also has certain conclusion, like foregone conclusions um, about, you know, the sorts of answers that he'll accept. And part of this essay, he's going to contrast the, the, answers of uh, the existentialist like Kierkegaard and uh, the phenomenologist like Husserl, and he's going to very reasonably explain both of their positions and then say, I don't like that answer. Give me a different one. Um, it, he right. has preconceived likes and dislikes and, and reasons that he doesn't like any of the existing answers, even though he can explain them perfectly fine. Um, to- yeah. Totally, totally. Well, so maybe, maybe up front, we should uh, frame this a little bit in terms of frame the kind of question or the problem that Camus is trying to deal with. And then we can maybe backtrack a little bit and talk about how he wound up with this question. So the first lines of this uh, piece are pretty famous. Uh, He says, right on page three here of my translation, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. And in fact, right after that, um, he quotes Nietzsche as, as saying that the, uh, the test of the philosophy of, of, like, if you really believe what you're philosophizing about is whether you go do it or not. Right. Um, gets back to your point about you kind of already know going into the book that he didn't in fact commit suicide so shouldn't that tell us what his answer is but right in the first paragraph he says actually that's only true if you trust Nietzsche right it could be that he comes to a conclusion that maybe we all should commit suicide and then he decides not to yeah right absolutely but Camus doesn't want to do that He, he is going to play by Nietzsche's rules Right. So, yeah. And this is this is a theme that Camus comes back to. I think Camus is very big on kind of integrity or um, being consistent with uh, in terms of he doesn't want to, you know, use logic to discover an ethic and then not be consistent with it in how he lives. So he he is kind of taking what he calls the Nietzschean criterion and saying, basically, like, you have to follow the argument where it leads and then carry out that thing. So if you truly, in your heart of hearts, come to the the philosophical position that suicide is the, the you know, moral position or the rational position to take, then that means you have to do it. Um, so, and he kind of pokes, pokes fun a little bit of Schopenhauer, who is somebody who praises suicide and and maybe at times says that suicide is the, the best position to take. But, um, as we know, he, he didn't actually kill himself. Um, but so this is, I guess why he says up front, like this is, this is a question of life or death. If you are somebody who is going to be consistent. You said he, he you said he prized consistency and I, I would even say stubbornness I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna just constantly uh, denigrate uh, <laughs> I'm a stronger language I mean, yeah. <laughs> fair, fair enough yeah he he is he is um, he is pretty stubborn throughout this in that he is pretty wedded to logic and he wants to stay he wants to be logically consistent in all of his thinking and he doesn't want to just accept truths or take these different leaves leaps of faith which he as we'll talk about later kind of criticizes other philosophers for doing so so this is like the question up front you know it's basically hamlet this is basically to be or not to be that is the question um and so right now we're just like, okay, yeah, I guess that's a pretty fundamental question. But like, why is he, why is he asking this question? And later on, 
we find maybe a more detailed version of that question uh, sounds something like this. Can a person live with the awareness of the absurd without trying to escape it via suicide or philosophical suicide? So that's kind of my own uh, phrasing of it. So he asked this question a few different times. Um, on page 16, he says, quote, I am interested not so much in absurd discoveries as in their consequences. How far is one to go to elude nothing? Is one to die voluntarily or to hope in spite of everything? And then on page 40, he says, I want to know whether I can live with what I know and with that alone. So... We're probably going to need to back up a little bit and define some of these terms because, you know, it's kind of like, wait, if somebody's not familiar with his thinking already, they're kind of like, wait, what is the absurd? What is philosophical suicide? Like, what is he talking about here? And in fact, even before we get to that, um, yeah. I want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, I think this is about the, the middle of the first section where he is talking about uh, suicide and um he says at one point that suicide has only or majorly been dealt with as a social phenomenon, right? That like a sociological sort of like, you know, um, when one person commits suicide, that causes other people to commit suicide and suicide is bad for society and ways of discouraging it or trying to cheer people up and so on as a societal um, mm. thing. And, and that he says is not at all what he's talking about here. He's talking about the individual motivation for voluntary suicide so not even someone who goes and you know gets drunk and decides that they're going to do something they wouldn't ordinarily do but like really he's saying seriously uh if you were philosophizing and and decided that life was meaningless and therefore you should commit suicide and, and then you carried that out in, in nietzsche's mm. uh, sense like that's the kind of thing he's really interested in here the individual intellectual uh, process by which someone might decide uh, that it would be better to die than to live. Yes. Yeah, and he, he does also talk also about like the different reasons that people commit suicide and that you know there are some people who in history have committed suicide out of a sense of honor, you know, like knowing that they're going to be killed by their enemies and, you know, deciding to, to kill themselves. I mean, this is like, Socrates or um, Seneca or you know some of these other even philosophers have have done this and he says like I'm not really talking about that so much I'm talking more of somebody who has maybe just discovered a truth or and, and, and I should also say he 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 starts with uh, the premise that like life is hard like life is struggle life is pain there is suffering so there is this kind of question of like is it worth it is it worth it to continue to live um and then is it worth it to continue to live if we find out that l like life is meaningless and absurd or, but did you have something else on that that point oh well just as soon as you start talking about whether it is worth it you've got two instances of the word it in that sentence and we don't really know what either of them means right is, is mm. what, what what exactly is life worth like what's the alternative right and this is exactly hamlet's problem right like right. we don't really even understand like okay life is suffering but like what's the alternative <laughs> right yeah and camu doesn't really go where hamlet goes where hamlet's kind of say well what if you know like after life there is a dream or there you know we don't we don't know what the alternative is with with the uncertainty of it that he's he's already not sure what to do and when he thinks about death he realizes well he doesn't even know what death is like at all so that's like from the firing pan into the fire right he, he really has no idea what's going to happen if he kills himself so at right. least he gets to stay in control of it um which in a sense is kind of what Camus Camus likes to be in control i think of, of his destiny um, but he sort of takes this an axiom that once you're dead, you, know, you rot and the worms eat you and, and you no longer have that control, right? He, he doesn't think of death as a big mystery in the way that Hamlet does. He thinks of death as like, okay, now you're dead and, and it's over and you lose. Right, right. I, I think, I think you're right. And 
So, it, and you're you're right. I think Camus does like to be in control. He also likes absolute cert- certainty and kind of like a Cartesian sense. And he even, at one point, he says, quote, these two certainties, my appetite for the absolute and for unity and the impossibility of reducing this world to a rational and reasonable principle. I also know that I cannot reconcile them. What other truth can I admit without lying, without bringing in a hope I lack and which means nothing within the limits of my condition? And this is his fundamental problem. Is he The two certainties he has is that he wants certainty. He wants to understand the world. He wants transcendence. He also calls it nostalgia. And the other thing is that the world is fundamentally unreasonable and silent to these answers. And so this creates a a kind of absurdity in his view in that humans desire reason and understanding in an unreasonable world and that the clash of those two things creates this absurdity. Or I guess another way of phrasing that is humans crave meaning in a world void of inherent meaning. Yeah, he has this phrase, uh, which you've already used, and I'm sure we've already used a couple times, uh, nostalgia for unity, um, where he's using this word nostalgia um, in a, a not normal yeah, sense, right? right? But, it, but I like this, this use, if I understand it correctly, um, because it is sort of a, a yearning, a longing, a homesickness for uh, things to make sense, you, you know, and, and this is something that people have as you get older, right? You think about, oh, things were so simple when I was a kid. You know, there were simple rules or, you know, and, you know, we'll get to social issues, but all your social issues were solved, you know, back then. And now it's also complicated in the adult world. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this nostalgia for unity is, is kind of the same idea that we we do feel the same sort of feeling for, wouldn't it be nice if everything just made sense? Mm. But as he points out at, at some point in here, um, this is sort of a homesickness for a home that we didn't actually come from and aren't actually ever going to return to, right? This home does not exist. The place where everything makes sense, right? Yeah. Like, it weren't actually simpler when you were a kid either. It just sort of felt that way because you were a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, with this idea that everything ought to make sense... It's the same idea. It's like, why do you think that? Nothing has ever made sense, right? Why do you expect things to make sense? And yet we do. Everybody does, right? Yeah. No, that I, you put it great. And he, he says, um, I, he uses a nice metaphor here. He says, quote, a blind man eager to see who knows that the night has no end. So that is, that is the absurd. Is the, the blind man knows that you can't understand the world uh, but has this yearning to understand to transcend that yearning for that nostalgia and he says that is absurd yes the the absurd or absurdity is the the interface the the butting up of, of this nostalgia for things to make sense with the the raw fact of the world which is never actually going to satisfy, you know, or, or be able to be explained by reason, right? As you said, the world is unreasonable. Right. Um, like literally, it cannot be reasoned. You're going to try to reason things out, and you're going to find that it actually does work quite a bit. And I think he kind of sells out of it short. Like, like science pretty much works, but there will, there does always come a time where you're trying to figure out why something is the way it is, and you realize that, like, you don't have a reason for it. Right? Yeah. And we, maybe we can talk a little bit about his critique of, of science and the people that kind of say, well, we, we do know the answers to the, these, you know, core questions. Like we can see down to the electrons and quarks. At one point he specifically talks about, uh, he, he says, uh, all the knowledge on earth will give me nothing to assure me that this world is mine. You can describe it to me and enumerate its laws. Um, and you can teach me the whole universe can be reduced to the atom and the atom can be reduced to the electron. And he says, all this is good. But then you try to explain the atom by analogy to a miniature solar system. And I realize that you have been reduced to poetry, that I shall never know. Um, right. Yeah. That, you know, at some point he's, we get to a point where the explanation starts sounding a little too much like bullshit. Mm. 
and Kamu becomes unhappy with this. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So yeah, and he, I think he says something like, I find that at the, when you boil it down at the heart of science, you're, is poetry or, or metaphor. Um, and that like, I think he says somewhere else, like even if you, with these models, they, you know, they say that it, it explains something, but it doesn't really explain anything because it's so, it's just become so abstracted that we need to then create some kind of metaphor to even be able to understand. And to a certain extent, um, he's just like a child asking why, right? I mean, why is the sky blue? And can say, well, it's because Rayleigh scattering, you know, and the, the red wavelengths go that way and the blue ones come this way. And so that's what we see. And he says, why? And you say, well, because the light rays at our retina and send signals to our brain. He says, why? And yeah. And, yeah. and you never, you, he never gets the understanding that he's seeking. Um, because it is kind of impossible, mm -hmm. but you can't just tell Camus that it's impossible because that's the whole point, right? That that's the whole reason he wrote the essay was he's not happy with the fact that that you'll never understand absolutely everything. Right. And one of the things I kind of wondered is how much of this is like kind of idiosyncratic to him versus like this is uh something like all humans kind of like have a problem with because he he definitely wants this he wants this absolute certainty almost in a kind of like neurotic obsessive compulsive kind of way and um i, I don't think that's true it's definitely not true of all people I, I think a lot of people are like fine just like not knowing a good deal and and don't really have as much issue with these paradoxes that will inevitably pop up when you start to see reason kind of turn in on itself whereas for him that's just like that's unacceptable yeah i mean well he he explicitly addresses that in, the, in a couple of places not necessarily in a in a useful way in a sort of cult way right where yeah you know, he says if you don't get it you don't get it but someday you will right one day you're gonna wake up and you're gonna realize that you've been going to the office eight hours a day, five days a week for 40 years. And what did it get you exactly, given that you're still going to die at the same age and you know, the meaninglessness of life. And you are going to awaken to this whole thing he's been talking about. And if it doesn't bug you this year, then maybe you just haven't awoken yet, right? That's the easy answer, right? Like most people are just right he's the, he's the one who's actually like alive to this possibility and is grappling with it and then he's also a little bit later going to get into these other philosophers like Kierkegaard who have become alive to the problem and then grappled with it and said you know what I'm going to just commit philosophical suicide right and I'm going to decide that like, like you said like oh, I don't care about this problem I'm not going to grapple with it. I'm just going to like shut off that part of my brain and not think about it and be happy. Mm. And he is not happy about that. He considers that to be philosophical suicide, not literal suicide, but you're still, you've taken the whole point of life to him is dealing with the absurd and said, I'm just going to, I'm still going to be alive, but I'm basically going to pretend I'm dead. I'm going to be brain dead. Yeah, yeah. Well, you said a few things that I wanted to comment on. You talked about like this feeling of the absurd kind of striking you at any given time. So he does say that this this um, kind of epiphany that that life is absurd is something that you can't just kind of snap your fingers and realize. Like it, it can kind of hit you in, I think he even says just like, he gives some examples of so it's just like some mundane things. You're just going about your life. You see somebody, you see a, I think he's one of them. He says like, you see a photo of yourself and you don't recognize yourself in the photo. And then you're just struck with this like feeling of the absurdity of life. He says at some point that the feeling of absurdity is not the, the idea of absurdity, mm. right? They're, that uh, they're related, of course, right? Every, every adjective or noun carries with it its whole universe of like, this is what it is to feel this way. Um, and so a lot of his examples, um, you mentioned the seeing a photograph of yourself and momentarily being confused about like, 
who is that? I don't remember that, right? I mean, that, that, yeah. that is that is that me? You see that in the mirror, right? He, he says, and again, this is something I don't think is universal. I've never looked in the mirror and thought, who is that guy? And, you know, why does his face look so funny? But, uh, you know, uh, Camus is, says, you know, every so often, you know, you're, you're going to have that feeling of, you know, what is that pile of meat in the, the mirror? Um, and, uh, you know, so he, he tries to elucidate these feelings uh, of, you know, how, what it feels like to, to deal with the absurd, in addition to its basic idea of, you know, it's essentially, you're trying to make things make sense, and, and they're not, they will not, they will never make sense, right? It's not just they don't make sense now, it's not that you're failing, it's that it is absurd to think that you might succeed. You, you have, you know, a sword and you're charging a machine gun nest, right? Mm. Machine gun nest is the unreasonableness of the world. And you've got your reason, which is the sword. And you really can't stop yourself from charging at the machine gun nest, right? I mean, that's all you have. You have a sword, okay, you're going to charge, but like, it's not going to work. And everybody knows it's not going to work. It is absurd, right? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought that that point up because I think that's like the closest he gets to defining absurdity. And I'm just going to read this this quote. You you illustrated it beautifully. This is on page 29. He says, "It's absurd means it's impossible, but also it's contradictory. If I see a man armed only with a sword attack a group of machine guns, I shall consider his act to be absurd. But it, it is but it is so solely by virtue of the disproportion between his intention and the reality he will encounter." of the contradiction I notice between his true strength and the aim he has in view. Likewise, we shall deem a verdict absurd when we contrast it with the verdict the facts apparently dictated. So, yeah, to carry this metaphor to this whole piece, he's saying we are just, yeah, we're that person trying to figure out the world or trying to ascribe meaning onto the world, and the world has no answer for us or no no meaning in his view and this is that's the clash and it takes both i think at another point he says like the world is not absurd the world is just irrational and humans are not absurd humans just want meaning and understanding it's the it's the combinations when you put those two together that you get this absurdity at one point he even says uh if i were a tree or a cat or something this wouldn't be a problem for me at all Right. If I were part of the world, um, I would just be part of the world. Right. The problem is that I don't feel part of the world. That I, I feel like I am something else. I am rationality as opposed to irrationality, and I need to try to explain the world, and, and that's the problem. Right. For sure. Cool. Well, I think we did a decent job of <laughs> trying to explain what what he means by the absurd. So then when we go back to our question, which is he repeats it throughout this whole book, like over and over, he's kind of obsessed by it, which is, can I live with this truth of the absurd without committing suicide or without committing log- uh, philosophical suicide, i.e., you know, just disappearing off into hope and saying, well, maybe someday I'll... Um, be able to understand the world or maybe someday uh there will be meaning or god or something uh like can i can i live with this truth or even i mean and and i do want to talk about this part because this is another of the parts that i thought i understood um as opposed to the parts that you know we're going to get eventually we're going to get to those deserts and, and whatnot that i'm not going to understand but um you know, he, he does spend quite a bit of time in the middle of the essay digressing into these two uh, sort of rival camps where he acknowledges that they have recognized the absurd. So they, they have come alive in a way that, you know, most philosophers over the, you know, it, he's not interested in Plato and, and Aristotle and so on, because they aren't even in the right game as far as he's concerned. They're, they're not uh, concerned with absurdity but Kierkegaard he likes Kierkegaard well he actually he hates Kierkegaard but he he think he respects Kierkegaard up to a um because Kierkegaard notices that the world doesn't make any sense and man's rationality is not up to the task um and that it 
like really seems like life has no meaning, I think. Not that I've read any Kierkegaard, mind you. Um, but uh, his solution to this, says Camus, is to abandon rationality, right? We've got this tripod or trinity of man and the world and the absurd where they interface. And Kierkegaard's solution is to knock out the man side of the tripod, uh, which gets rid of the absurdity. And he just says, this irrational uh, universe, uh, you know, man cannot understand it. It's ineffable. Uh, you just have to let go and let God and um, ta-da, problem solved. And Camus can explain this, but he can't. He can't accept it. He does not want to. Accept he calls it. when he kind of calls it a cop out. Yeah. He's saying, "Well, you're just uh, you're not you're not staying too. You're you're adding this other thing called God. You're kind of taking this uh, leap of faith to instead of sticking with the the problem. He see this is what he calls philosophical suicide is kind of abandoning logic and rationality in order to insert a God or something in order to make sense of this problem. And in fact, characterizes it. I would say not as inserting another god, but as just kicking out the the rational man side of things, and the irrational universe itself becomes god, or is caused by god, or something. Right? It exactly, exactly. And he says, uh, just just to read him on this, he says, uh, "Quote: Kierkegaard likewise takes the leap. His childhood, having been so frightened by Christianity, he ultimately returns to its harshest aspect." For him to antinimity and paradox become criteria of the religious, thus the very thing that led to despair of the meaning and depth of this life now gives it its truth and its clarity. Yeah. So yeah, by calling paradox and irrationality God, that that kind of solves the problem. And Camus says, no, like you you, you can't you can't just do that. You can't. Uh, you can't commit philosophical suicide. And he doesn't just pick on Kierke Kierkegaard. He talks about Shestov and uh, Carl Jaspers and even Dostoevsky later in the essay as kind of all doing a version of that, yeah. albeit in a somewhat kind of different way. In fact, when, when we did this in uh, one of the meetup groups, uh, we did Myth of Sisyphus, and I remember relating this to that. Uh, there's a webcomic with... Uh, some animal saying, you know, I'm mad. And, and someone hands them a file folder and says, here's a solution. And they set the file folder on fire and say, I don't want the solution. I want to be mad. This is, this is Camus, right? Art is handing him the, an answer here and, uh, and he's setting fire to it and saying, yeah, but I don't want that. I want to be mad. Um, which he really, all the way to the end, like he, his solution is going to be get mad about it and just stay mad forever. And die mad. <laughs> well, well, that's a good that's a good point. I mean, because he he is saying like Otis, like this doesn't actually solve the problem. It just kind of uh, eludes the problem, um, or is another way of kind of burying your head in the sand. And we should mention now he also take, says the same thing is true when it comes to actual suicide, and that suicide doesn't solve the problem. It just um, you're just like eluding the problem. Uh, you're not actually like confronting the problem and I, I was listening to uh actually a lecture on this and on, on youtube with this philosophy professor uh Greg, gregory gregory sadler just to give credit where credit's due he was saying like the the analogy he used is uh you know if you have like a leaky faucet in your kitchen you can either fix the faucet um but something like suicide would just be like moving to a different apartment or philosophical suicide where it's like you didn't actually fix the, the pro. So that's maybe a way of kind of illustrating what I didn't realize that was going to be an analogy there. I thought it was going to be, you could fix the leak or you could commit suicide. And you wouldn't oh, well, yeah, that's, that's maybe <laughs> right. Um, so the other group of philosophers besides Kierkegaard, uh, that, talks about here is the uh, phenomenologists yeah. uh, uh, Husserl particular and again I've never read any Husserl I only know what I learned from Camus horribly obfuscated prose um, but uh, 
his take on them at least seems to be sort of Plato taken to like a super extreme where, yeah. you know, Plato wanted to say that ev every object has like sort of a, an ideal form, right. In the abstract or uh, in the concrete, just not here, just somewhere else in the platonic realm of forms. Um, you know, there's a platonic ideal of a coffee cup and, and of coffee and a donut and so on. Um, and uh, that kind of falls down, right? That's not, that doesn't work. Uh, so the phenomenologists in, again, in Camus words filtered through me, so I don't know what I'm talking about, said, um, instead of saying there's a platonic coffee cup that all coffee cups are a uh, sort of projection of, we'll just say that there is a platonic form of this coffee cup and also a platonic form of that coffee cup. And a platonic form of that coffee cup, and, and you know, for every coffee cup in the world, there is a perfect ideal form of it, which is identical with itself. And if you want to know what something is like, all you have to do is look at it, and you will see what it is like, and that's going to tell you what it's like. And that's the only question that matters. And so everything sort of dissolves into a foam of descriptive, uh, you know, description, descriptiveness. Um, yeah, um, where every object just is what it is and this is a rule that works perfectly 100 percent of the time and everything is solved forever pure, pure rationality in other words and, yeah. and camus looks at this and says well this is stupid and i i, I would agree with that <laughs> well and he says that ultimately it leads them to the same place that kierkegaard was led, which, you know, they're kind of, uh, uh, Husserl and the phenomenologists are kind of inserting a God, but through kind of like hyper rationality, whereas, uh, Kierkegaard is getting there through kind of calling God, kind of calling the irrational God. So Even I think he, he makes God. the point that they're, I don't think, what's that? I don't think the phenomenologist would call it God, but yeah. it's, analogous that they're just kicking one of the legs out of the tripod they're just kicking out the irrational they're saying we perfectly understand everything because it is what it is um and actually i'm going to make another uh comparison here to uh another of the uh book clubs that i did uh, maybe like a year ago read a book called a night of serious drinking um at least that's what it's called in english um and it, it's a sort of satire, Gulliver's Travel style. So I, I, I highly recommend it. It was fun. Um, oh, cool, relatively cool. short. And there's a point at which our sort of Gulliver figure is traveling in the land of, uh, you know, sort of scientist types. And um, the scientists are explaining to him that uh, the Earth goes around the sun because the sun is located at the focus of the ellipse that the Earth travels through each year. Uh, and cows eat grass because they are herbivores, um, so that you know, they don't eat meat. Right? And, uh, right, right. You're not actually really explaining anything. Like it seems like you are, but 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 you're not. I mean, it's kind of like built in the definition. But sorry, go ahead, go on. Well, I wasn't even to yeah. the punchline, which is oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. yeah. Ice floats in water because uh, ice has a lower density than water. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I see. I see where you're going with it. Like it's, it, it seems like it's explaining something, but it kind of begs the question. Yeah. Well, then why does it have a lower density than water? Yeah. And, and does having a lower density really mean anything different from that? If you put one in the other, it will float, you know, like, um, it, like everything ultimately sort of is what it is. Right. I mean, how can you explain anything if, if the answer is just, you're just rephrasing it tautologically, you know? In different well, and I think, and I think that's a great uh, going back to his kind of critique of science. I mean, I think it's that same type of he would kind of say the same thing. You're still left being that kid asking why, because it's like even if the scientists can say, well, the reason that um, you know this thing floats is because of you know the when you look at it at the molecular level, like blah blah blah, you're still left with being like, well, well, why? Yeah, but why? Yeah, but why? And you can just do that ad infinitum. At a certain point, it, I, you know, I, I actually am now starting for the first time to have sympathy for the phenomenologists because 
if you think about the child asking why, normally I think of that as asking for deeper and deeper whys, right? Like, okay, I get that part, but why at a deeper level? And you keep going deeper and deeper. And, mm. and there's, but at a, another way of looking at that, though, is that ultimately if you're asking, like, why is the sky blue, you're just observing and describing something about the world. You're saying the sky is blue, right? Yeah. And then you're saying why, and the scientist or the father or whoever is having to come up with ways of phrasing facts about the world that are commensurate with the idea that the sky is blue. And you can say, well, because it reflects more wavelengths that we perceive as blue. And But that's it's really just restating. Right? It's, it's all tautologies, because all you can do is either say things that are true about the world, which don't tell you anything because it's already true, or things that are false, which are just lies, right? Why, why does the wind blowing hard today? Well, it's because the trees are sneezing, right? Um, right? It, it's either true or it's false. But ultimately, it can't explain anything because if it's true, it's tautological. And if it's false, it's not. Um, right. You know. Yeah. And, and I think that is what he's saying. And that's that's why he's he's saying it's it's futile to ever think that we'll be able to understand understand and that's that's the absurdity is we're we're always going to want to understand and have that nostalgia to understand but it's 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 futile in his view and that's the absurdity um well and we so we've talked a bit about this the philosophical suicide um i thought it might be useful before we talk about like some of what he says might be the solution to this problem is to talk just a little bit about his like his ethic and Kimu like I, I think he didn't like labels like he he never wanted to be called a philosopher his whole life like he, he didn't want to be called an existentialist though like come on he's he's definitely a philosopher and like uh, he's a bit of an existentialist as well um, but he also throughout this essay like says that he doesn't have an ethic but he clearly does. I mean, I mean, and I think his ethic has to do with kind of what we talked about at the beginning, like being consistent and being um, that having that authenticity to basically follow the philosophical argument where it leads and to live consistently with that. And the other thing I, that he's really big on is to remain conscious of certain hard truths that are hard to bear and in this case we're talking about the absurdity of life but i think he would probably be uh, defend that for any truth that's you know like bearing the truth that like your husband's probably not going to come back or or, like he i think he's he's big on like abandoning hope in that regard so i think that's one of his that's one of his ethics i don't know would you would you agree with that or um I would say that he sees this, the, the problem of suicide, as the big problem. I mean, he says it right at the beginning, and, and right at the beginning, he also does mention Galileo in, in a, I guess you would say, unfavorable light, because he points out that Galileo did not die for the truth, right? He, he said, oh, okay, fine, yeah, the sun goes around the earth, whatever, right? Like, don't, don't mm. burn me, bro. And, and then and they didn't. Um, yeah, you know, so he says there are some truths that are not worth dying for, but he considers this question of, you know, what is the meaning of life, basically, and, and like, should one commit suicide, by definition, is worth dying for, because if you decide it one way, you're going to die, and if you decide the other way, you won't. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure that he sees all truths as uh, important. Uh, you know, some of them are certainly not worth dying for. Um, but certain ones are, and he has a sort of obsession with some of them. And I'm not sure it's completely rational about, you know, how he decides, uh, you know, which truths he's going to really pursue and which ones he won't. Um, sure. That, that makes sense. Yeah. In this, I mean, yeah. And he like, again, part of the reason he comes down so hard on all of these other existentialists is that in his mind they have come face to face with this truth and then just kind of like pushed it to the side or tried to get rid of it um and he's just like no we have to sit on this like dizzying crest and really really sit with it and he's like again his question is like can i live with this truth yes 
Yeah. So maybe we can, that's maybe a good transition to talk about how, how we can live with this disease that he sees. Uh, so we're, I mean, we're obviously skipping a, a decent amount of this. Um, there's a whole middle section, the absurd man and the absurd creation, uh, which maybe we'll touch on a little bit towards the end. But um, I want to kind of get to this, the myth of Sisyphus. Yes. Uh, so this is his chapter where he kind of sums up a lot of this. And he starts off by talking about the Greek myth of Sisyphus. And he gives a little background of like what actually happened in the myth of Sisyphus. Um, just a personal aside, like I, I was doing some research outside of this and there's different accounts of the myth of Sisyphus than the one that he has. But generally the part that is consistent with all of the tellings of it is Sisyphus was uh, punished by the gods to eternally roll a boulder up the top up to the top of a hill only to have that boulder once he reached the top roll back down and then sisyphus would have to go back to the bottom roll it up again uh for eternity and camus liz oh yeah there are a couple things that sisyphus did to merit that punishment uh, yeah yeah goes into a little bit here and i imagine that's the part where the the stories probably differ uh, yeah i I've heard some different uh, different uh, sources say different things about what Sisyphus did to deserve the punishment. One of the ones that I found kind of interesting was that he, um, well, he he was in he was in the underworld for something else, but he escaped by tricking death and chaining up death with these chains, and then like went back and like was living the rest of his life. Uh, so that's that's an interesting one in that like there maybe is some symbolism there in that Sisyphus in Camus even says Sisyphus, Sisyphus is the absurd hero because he wants to live and rejects death and doesn't want to die. Um, and the symbolism I, I saw was like, well, his punishment is to be immortal and to have to, you know, it's like oh, you didn't want to die. Okay, well, here's your punishment. Now you have to live forever doing this over and over and over. But maybe that's just my own uh, reading into it. Well, he's in that same category of uh, number one, generally tricksters. Uh, although I guess that's a pretty broad category. Um, mm. Yeah, But uh, Loki um, and Prometheus are in the same uh, genre of uh, the, these sort of tricksters who play one great prank on the gods um, you know, in, in Loki's case, it was, you know, being Loki, uh, in Prometheus's case, it was stealing fire and, and messing up with the sacrifices and so on. And, um, in Sisyphus's case, the other thing that uh, Camus mentions about him was that, uh, one time a, uh, uh, was it, uh, Isopus, um, was, uh, carried off by, by Zeus, the, you know, the king of the gods, uh, went off and carried off a river god's daughter to, you know, do mm. all Zeus stuff with her. And um, Asopus went to Sisyphus and, and said, have you seen my daughter? And Sisyphus said, uh, pay me and I'll tell you. And so he paid him and, and uh, Sisyphus said, he, Zeus took her, he's over there. And yeah. uh, Zeus didn't like that either. Um, right, I think that's the thing that landed him in, in the underworld in the first, in the first yeah. instance. Um, and then he chained up death to get out but yeah and, and so all of these tricksters uh, another one is tantalus tantalus uh he, his trick was uh he needed something really good for the gods to eat and so he chopped up his son and he fed them um uh, his son and uh, they didn't mm. like that it turned out um and, and so all of these figures end up with some sort of eternal punishment of you know with tantalus he's uh they, he's got grapes over his head but every time he reaches for them they recede and, and so he can never get them and they're tantalus. Mm. Uh, with uh, Loki, he's getting poison dripped on him forever, and it, his wife is catching it in a bowl. So it's no, normally it's not dripping on him, but every so often she has to empty the bowl, and so then it's uh, you know he gets dripped on a little bit uh, forever. Uh, and Prometheus, of course, is getting his liver eaten by an eagle every day, and uh, Sisyphus is pushing the rock up the hill every day. So this this is a very common uh, myth archetype. Um, mm. And so, in other words, Sisyphus is not, in, in mythology, he's not unique 
really in any way. Um, but uh, he works very well for Camus, uh, particularly with his exact form of punishment of rolling this rock. This, this is very much, uh, you know, I, I think the the nine to five, five days a week guy can identify with Sisyphus rolling the rock a lot more than yeah. you know Prometheus getting his liver eaten. So it, it really works very well as this idea of life being toil and struggle and, and not getting anywhere. Right, and that's that's the the big point that he's drawing is like the reason he brings up this myth is he's like saying this is life is you know one struggle after next you're pushing up this rock only to do it all over again and ultimately it's futile ultimately you know once we you know reach our goals or we we get our desires uh fulfilled we're just going to have another desire we're just going to have the next hurdle or challenge to 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 do um yeah and the the other thing i think is worth bringing attention to this story is he's saying the thing that makes this a tragedy he's talking about sisyphus here the thing that makes this tragedy is that sisyphus is conscious is conscious of the fact that it is futile and that if he weren't aware of that, if he had some hope of like, oh, you know, maybe after I push the boulder to the top of the mountain after the hundredth time, you know, I'll be released from this or, or whatever, um, you know, then it wouldn't be a tragedy. But knowing that it's ultimately futile, that's what makes it a tragedy. And um, in, in fact, was, he, he mentions yeah. Oedipus as well in this section. Um, mm. Says that only at the point where Oedipus realizes what's going on does his tragedy begin? Um, and when I read that, I thought, like, what? No. Um, you know, like, the, the whole point of Oedipus is that he knows the fate from the very beginning. Right? Like, he's told by heart the very, very beginning of the story, you're going to kill your father and marry your mother. And it's his hubris in in rejecting that fate and, and like, trying to have something else happen that, that really triggers the whole tragedy. But in a sense, maybe now I, I see a little bit more of Camus' idea there that um, Oedipus might have been told his fate, but by definition, he didn't believe it, right? He thought, he had hope, right? He thought that he could get out of it. He tried different things. He said, I'm going to move away from my, my home. I'm going to do different things. And um, it's only really when it dawns on him that he didn't escape it, that it all is happening, that's when he starts believing the prophecy. And, and that's really when it becomes like a, a tragedy for him. Right. Right. So, and yeah, and that's that's a big that's I'm glad, glad you brought that up because that's a big theme is like as long as the person has hope, it's it's not it's not a tragedy. But it's it's when that person realizes that it is ultimately futile and does and doesn't have hope. And I even thought of like um, uh, Man's Search for Meaning by um, Viktor Frankl. Um, so he was a Holocaust survivor and uh, he wrote about like. Basically, the thing that carried him through when things were really tough in the concentration camp was the hope of his of some day seeing his wife again, and that like that was the thing for a lot of people, a lot of Jews in the concentration camp was like just thinking of like okay, I thinking of this thing in the future that is giving me hope to ultimately get through this because there was even I, I thought it was interesting reading this because I, I've even heard accounts of uh, the Holocaust where the Nazis would force the Jews to carry like these giant cement barrels across the concentration camp and then only to have them bring it back again they would kind of purposefully make them do these like futile tasks or like have them like dig a hole and then which was like backbreaking labor. And then at the end of the day, they would take the dirt that they dug and put it back in the hole. So they were like aware that there's something like extra fucked up about making the task completely fe meaningless and futile. Um, but where was I going with this? Oh, but, but ultimately like for Victor Frankl, he's saying it's, it was hope that um, kept a lot of these people going. Yeah. Which is different from, Camus, in, in the sense that you know, when you set one of those tasks, that I think the idea is to try to break the person's spirit, right? That that like, yeah. oh, ha, 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 they're going to see that this is a 
a pointless task, and that's going to lead them to uh, to abandon hope and, and to, to, to sort of break their spirit, whatever that means. Um, and for Camus, he would say, "Oh no, that's just going to harden my spirit. You know, to that I'm going to see that this is futile, and I'm going, you know, I'm going to be like Sisyphus. I'm going to, uh, you know, whistle while I work." Uh, find meaning in the meaningless task and so on. Right. And that, that is ultimately his, his solution. So he talks about um, how it is consciousness that causes it, this to be a tragedy and causes us to suffer. It's, it's our a consciousness that gives us the ability to, to, in his view, see that life is meaningless. But he says it is also consciousness that allows us to, solve the problem in his view it's consciousness that allows us to choose to be happy despite this and and maybe i'll read this uh so this is page uh, 121 he says quote if this myth is tragic that is because its hero is conscious where would his torture be indeed if at, at every step the hope of succeeding upheld him the workman of today works every day in his life at the same tasks and this fate is no less absurd but it is tragic only at the rare moments when it becomes conscious. And then he says the lucidity that was to constitute his torture at the same time crowns his victory. Well, one of the bits that I really liked about the, the myth of Sisyphus bit, and we, we mentioned this at the beginning, that this is the one section where he allows himself to break into uh, actually aesthetically pleasing prose, uh, right? um, even better than his fiction. Uh, he says... Uh, Nothing is about Sisyphus, but uh, one sees merely the whole effort of a body straining to raise the huge stone, to roll it, and to push it up a slope a hundred times over. One sees the face screwed up, the cheek tight against the stone, the shoulder bracing the clay-covered mass, the foot wedging it, the fresh start with arms outstretched, the wholly human security of two earth-clotted hands. Um, yeah, he's really going through every part of the body, every sense, and, and really giving you that picture, that, that descriptive picture, that phenomenological picture of, of exactly the way in which this task is carried out, this meaningless task is carried out and, and the, the sense of being there. And as a reader of it, I have, even though I hated the whole rest of the essay, you know, I have to say that is aesthetically pleasing to be experiencing that you know, meaningless task in a really present way. And I think that's his point that, uh, you know, to be in this life, even if it is meaningless, especially if it is meaningless, right? You're not looking for anything greater. He's not looking forward to what's going to happen when the stone comes down the other side of the hill or, you know, when he, when he gets his reward in heaven or anything, he's not looking at any of that. He's just looking at, you know, the, the feeling of the earth in your hands and the, the muscles pushing and, you know, like being in the moment is the reward. Um, and I think the reader gets that too in, in this particular part of the, uh, the book. Yeah. And the very last line of this, um, he says, quote, the struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart, which I think is a big part of it. It's like, again, he's saying like life, life is the, the pushing of the boulder and like that is enough or that can be enough. It made me think of like the John Lennon quote where he says like life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. And that like, like to, I think to Camus is like life is what happens when you're pushing the boulder up the mountain. It's not, you know, getting to the top of the mountain and everything being like fine and dandy from here on out. Um, that there might be these, T- you know moments where we do reach the top of the mountain and we get a bit of a breather and we look around and we're like this is great but ultimately like there's going to be there's going to be an- another challenge and that it's in Camus view I think it's it's an illusion to think that like it's just going to be smooth sailing once we reach the top it makes me think of um also makes me think of like uh, Robin Williams I, he in an interview once he said something like after winning the Academy Award that made me happy and satisfied for like maybe a week 
before I was, you know, miserable again or like then trying to, you know, carry out my next goal. So I that's for me how I read this last chapter. He's, he's, that's why he says like we have to get get rid of hope, this hope that like ultimately we're going to have uh, meaning or there's going to be a someday either in this life or an afterlife and accept that like this pushing of the boulder, this is life and we need to find joy and meaning in the struggle itself. Maybe that's my optimistic uh, interpretation of it, but... Um, no, I mean, I, I think that that is a... For, you know, we, we could end on that note uh, and I don't think that would be wrong. Um, but again, I do want to just be real cynical here and say I don't really think Camus has supported his... You know, well, why we need to come to this conclusion. I, I think that it's a, um, yeah, essentially an uplifting conclusion. We're saying that uh, uh, you, you gave the John Lennon quote, uh, life is what happens when we're busy making other plans. And I think that acknowledges the absurdity, right? That we're trying to make other plans and, and rationalize what's going to happen. And it turns out life is just going to go on without us anyway. Uh, yeah. And so Camus' answer to that is, okay, let's not make any other plans let's actually enjoy life. Uh, we must imagine Sisyphus happy. But like, why again? Why must I do that? Why can't I imagine Sisyphus being real sad? I mean, the ancient Greeks did. Um, Camus finds this philosophy comforting, maybe. Um, he, he finds it uh, uh, good, right? He, he wants us to do this philosophy, but it's not really clear to me that it's been justified yeah well that that's fair i mean my my understanding was you know we didn't choose to be born into this absurd world like we basically we didn't choose these cards that we were dealt in his his view consciousness is the thing that allows us to rise above this absurd fate and he does say, um, in, in the kind of the metaphor he uses is that when Sisyphus is walking down the mountain to kind of do it all over again, that is that kind of to him represents the rare times in our lives where we are reflective of, hey, this this day to day like struggles. This is life. Life is not something that's gonna like begin, you know, after college or begin after I have a baby or whatever like this you're in it now and he's saying that maybe i'll I'll read this because he does say like sometimes when we reflect on this like the sorrow and the grief is just too much and we do kind of have these like dark nights of the soul he says um quote again i fancy sisyphus returning towards his rock and the sorrow was in the beginning when the images of earth cling too tightly to memory, when the call of happiness becomes too insistent, it happens that melancholy rises in man's heart. This is the rock's victory. This is the rock itself. The boundless grief is too heavy to bear. These are our nights of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. A Gethsemane. Okay, thank you. He says, but crushing truths perish from being acknowledged. And I think this is like his core belief through all of this, which is that by, again, keeping these hard to bear truths in mind and keeping them conscious that we're able to kind of uh, overcome them, at least in his view. This is, I think, why he is so gung-ho about like, we have to just accept and acknowledge these truths and really sit with them because by doing that, we're able to kind of make them smaller. And that if we just bury our heads in the sand, that they have power over us. At least that's how I interpreted that line. But I'm curious, I'm curious what you think as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the key sentence there being crushing truths perish from being acknowledged. Um, and he goes from there into the line about Oedipus, um, which again, I do not fully understand. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that it's that same idea that, that you said of, of if there is something 
uh, like, oh, I have just discovered the world is meaningless. This is, you know, this, this makes me sad. Um, but if I acknowledge it and I say it and I, you know, sit with it, then I can say, okay, yes, the world is meaningless, but guess what? I'm still going to go on and, you know, do my thing. And that can give me a feeling not of, you know, sadness and impotence, but of, right, sort of this stubborn, uh, you know, spirit um, where I, I am overcoming or overcoming is not the right word because of course we are not going to overcome. We have no hope of overcoming. Um, but, you know, I am persevering against the, you know, whatever it is that, that is crushing. Um, he does, he does use similar language though, but cause he says like, um, at those moments when he leaves the heights and gradually sinks towards the layers of the God, he is superior to his fate. He is stronger than his rock. So it does kind of evoke that like overcoming and that like, again, you didn't choose to be born into a meaningless world in his view, but we can choose how we respond to it. Um, if I want to get really cheesy, it makes me think of the, like the Gandalf quote in Lord of the Rings where Frodo says like, I didn't choose this. I never wanted the ring to be brought to me. I wish none of this would have happened. And then Gandalf says, like, so do all who live to see such times, but it is not for you to decide. All you can do is to decide what is to, what to do with the time that is given to you. And I, I think, as cheesy as it sounds, I think that's what he's saying, is, like, the only choice that we do have is how to respond to this, you know, potentially crushing truth which is that life is meaningless and absurd yes I, i'm amazed that you remembered that much of that quote uh <laughs> you were not looking it up that was all he was looking right at me when he said it uh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it just shows how many times i've watched uh lord of the rings yeah, okay. um yeah well somehow we've gotten to the end of uh the yeah this was this was a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, I uh, I got a lot out of it this time. Um, I'm glad that we were able to. I'm glad we were able to do it. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me and uh, having me. Thanks for listening to Unpacking Ideas. If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with a friend, or scroll down and write us a review, or give us a rating. I know that all takes a little bit of effort, but it really helps with the algorithm so that more people can discover the show. So thanks for doing that in advance. If you would like to get in touch with me, please visit unpackingideas.com. Or if you would like to see what's coming up on the podcast, uh, visit unpackingideas.com forward slash podcast. And there I post links to articles and essays and books that we'll be discussing on future podcast episodes. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. Thanks so much for listening, and I will see you next time.